This symposium, Gender Rules, Conversations About Access, Outcome, and Equality, is the result of a collaboration between the Association of Yale Alumni, the Women Faculty Forum, and Yale Women. My name is Laura Grondin, and I am the chair of Yale Women. Um, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of Yale Women to the symposium. Yale Women is the organization that encompasses all female Yale graduates, uh, regardless of what school they graduated from. Uh, we were formed about three years ago to engage our constituents in educational, cultural, and community building activities. Today, we have 17 chapters and more are coming online every day. And we have almost 10,000 women that have engaged with the organization in one way or another. We sincerely hope that this symposium will address women's representation and the need for gender diversity and equality in all the complexity the issue deserves. Before we started, I wanted to just share a little bit of my uh, personal experience. Um, for almost 30 years, I have worked in heavy manufacturing, a very male-dominated environment. I would say what has changed during the time that I've been there, I went from being the only woman in the room to being one of several women in the room, but still um, a significant uh, minority. But what I would say has changed on behalf of the men that are in the room is that they're more interested in having women in the room. And I honestly think that sometimes they don't know how to make that happen. And they don't necessarily know what to do once they get a woman in the room. <laughs> Honestly, I have had some really inappropriate remarks made to me. Um, the, and, I'm work, and I work in an industry where I'm still mistaken for my general manager's wife. Um, this can be uh, annoying, but it also can be very embarrassing once they find out the truth. But what I hope to learn today, and what I hope that all of you will take away, is some pieces of information that you can share. Share with your fellow women, share with the men in your life. I recently spoke uh, at a conference for the American Foundry Society. I was one of seven people on a panel. As you may predict, I was the only woman on the panel. I had the opportunity to that audience to share a couple of things that I have learned. Um, in part, some of these things I've actually learned through my involvement with Yale Women, but also through other organizations. The first thing that I shared with them is that we all come to a situation with a certain amount of innate bias. We look at people, and if they look like us, we assume a certain level of capability beyond um, looking at someone that looks different to us. The other thing that I shared with this group of mostly all men is that women feel like, will need to feel like they can before they will raise their hand to do the job. Ooh, something changed. Whereas a man will only feel that he needs to be able to do 60% of a job. Now, if you translate that into people asking for a promotion, most people, when you're promoting them, you don't expect them to be able to do 90% of the job. So what does that mean? That means that the, that the men, if the men are making the decision, they're not looking at the women in the same way as they're looking at a, a male candidate. And then the female candidate is then not raising her hand on top of it. And I, my point in sharing this with the men that were in that room is that, that they are the ones often making those decisions. Um, and my encouragement to all of you is to take those opportunities, my real point in telling you this story is that I wanna encourage you to take what you hear today, take the things that you've learned and share them. Because if we only impact the few people, I shouldn't say few, but if we only impact the people that are in this room, we will not have taken the full advantage of the content that we're gonna to hear today. And now I would like to introduce Paula Kavathis, and she will uh, tell you about the Women's Faculty Forum. I'd like to welcome everybody here. Um, it's tremendous to have an event like this here at Yale. I'm chair of the Women's Faculty Forum. Uh, we are an organization that started in 2001 uh, during Yale's tercentennial when a group of women faculty got together 
and organized a conference called Gender Matters. We are a university-wide group of women, and one of our main goals is to foster gender equity and diversity throughout the university. I'd like to give you an example of a project that we have that I'm very excited about. When I walk through the halls of the Sterling um, Hall of Medicine and look at the portraits of the deans, they're all men. The iconography of an institution reveals something about the conception and history of the place, who wields power, who matters, and what is possible. To create a more diverse iconography, uh, we are commissioning a portrait of the first women to obtain Yale PhDs in 1894. We have done research on them and amazingly identified six pictures of the seven. Uh, during the past year, we had an open competition for artists. We then selected four to submit sketches, and we have now selected one of the artists. And this portrait will hang in the nave of the Sterling Hall of Medicine, a beautiful and very prominent place at the university. And I think it will really um, be a part of the transformation of iconography here at Yale. This theme of the conference is very timely. Uh, the new UN initiative called He for She aims to involve both men and women in gender equity. Here at Yale, the president of the provost's office are developing a new initiative for diversity. Since I've come to Yale, I first came to Yale in 1986, we've made tremendous progress in diversity. Faculty, students, leadership positions, examples being Mary Miller, who's on our panel this afternoon, the first uh, woman to be dean of Yale College. Now we have Jonathan Holloway, the first African American to be dean of Yale College. But we still have more to do. Uh, an example being at the medical school, we have 29 chairs and um, uh, they are overwhelmingly men. And since, 18, uh, since 1992, uh, there has been really no increase in the proportion which was two, two women out of the 29. So this is not just timely, but also important. I'm particularly pleased that the Yale Women Faculty Forum had the opportunity to collaborate with Yale women in organizing this symposium. They're a terrific group of women. And it is through working together, alums, and um, people, members of our current community that we can really help promote diversity here at Yale. We're a incredibly fantastic university and we are a model for the world. Now I was going to um, uh, introduce uh, Marta Moret, uh, president of Urban Policy Strategies and also I recently learned affectionately known as Floy, first lady of Yale. Uh, she um, is a tremendous friend to Yale women and also cares very deeply about the well-being of women here on the campus. Unfortunately, she um, had an illness and is unable to be here this morning. And it was very difficult for us to find a substitute. So we weren't really able to get somebody who's equivalent to her. So we, but we, we did our best and um, President Salovey uh, was willing to step in and say a few words uh, that she had prepared for us. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. That was great. Good morning, everybody. And uh, for those of you who are normally not on this campus, welcome to Yale and New Haven. And uh, for those of you who are, it's great to see you this morning. Uh, Marta did uh, give me something to read to you. Dear friends and colleagues, I'm so sorry that a medical situation of my brother's family called me away today as I was looking forward to attending the Gender Rules Conference. I'm very thankful that Yale Women and the Women Faculty Forum are focusing our attention on the important issue of creating a university environment that supports the careers of women, especially women of color, and promotes gender equity. Peter and I discussed the important goals uh, of uh, 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 creating environments that support the careers of women and promoting gender equity quite frequently. And as my friends in Yale Women know, 
uh, those goals are near and dear to our hearts. I'm also pleased that Yale Women is the fastest growing alumni group in the AYA. How great is that? I hope you all have a productive and stimulating day today. I look forward to reading the proceedings and seeing so many of you soon. Warm wishes, Marta Elisa Moret, MPH 1984. Let me just say that uh, all of the sentiments uh, uh, expressed by Marta in that note, certainly I share them as well and I look forward to uh, circling back at the end of the day and uh, 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 talking about them with you. And of course, I look forward to the sessions unfolding today. Glad I could join you. Sorry Marta is not here, but uh, I think we're going to have a stimulating and exciting day. Uh, once again, thank you all for being here. Where we are today is a topic on which, in some sense, everyone here is an expert. You all know in your own lives what it feels like to be a professional woman. And we do want to engage all of you in the conversation, uh, but we're very fortunate to have with us, to get us situated, a panel of experts who bring an array of disciplinary and professional experience to this topic. So let me just introduce them to you. Um, first is, and we're going to go in alphabetical order, so I'm going to introduce them to you in alphabetical order. Um, professor Victoria Breskol is a professor here in the School of Management. Her work focuses on the impact of stereotypes on individuals' status and power within organizations, particularly for individuals who violate gender stereotypes. One of her papers is called, Can an Angry Woman Get Ahead? <laughs> Published yeah. in Psychological <laughs> Science. <laughs> That's my five years of work. Uh, very interesting conclusion that people reward men sometimes who get angry, but view angry women as uncompetent and unworthy of status and power in the workplace. Another uh, somewhat provocative piece who takes the floor and why? Gender power and volubility in organizations. Shows that for men, there's a strong relationship between having power and talking a lot in meetings. Whereas for women, that relationship seems weak. It doesn't really seem to exist. And so these are some of the things that she's going to help us uh, understand and unpack uh, as we interpret our own lives. Our second panelist is Kimberly Goff Cruz, who is the Secretary and Vice President for Student Life here at Yale. She is a lawyer. She has a JD from Yale, spent some time as a, uh, a lawyer in private practice before entering the, uh, administ a variety of administrative roles in universities. Before coming back to Yale, she held a position as Vice President for campus life and dean of students at the University of Chicago. So she's, she's going to bring a perspective uh, both from the legal field and from higher education. Sitting next to Kimberly Goff Cruz is Kimberly Shawman, professor of sociology at University of California, Davis and her specialty is on women in the workplace, uh, in fact, in a variety of workplaces. One of her recent books is entitled Women in Science, Career Processes and Outcomes. Uh, and she has also researched widely in the areas of uh, the influence of anti-discrimination laws on gender equity uh, in the labor market. And then finally, Debbie Walsh is the director of the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers University. This is a nationally recognized um, institution that provides information about women's political participation. She has been director since 1981, so she has really brought that institution into uh, prominence in today's world. They study a whole range of things, including leadership and campaign training programs that empower women of all ages to participate in politics and public life, research illuminating women's 
distinctive contributions, uh, and how the uh, women's political career has changed over the last few decades. What I'm going to just try to do is, is tell you a little bit about um, you know, what's going on in terms of uh, you know, the role of gender stereotypes in reproducing gender inequality um, in the workplace, because I'm in the business school, so I think I was designated as that person. Um, but then also, um, what I really more want to talk about is, is what we can do about this. In the working world, uh, gender inequality still is a problem. So many of you have probably heard you know, the statistics, right, that right now we still have only um, 25 women um, CEOs in the Fortune 500. And you know, there's a lot of other statistics like this, but one thing I do want to say, and we're going to hear the statistics from the other panelists as well, is that um, sometimes it can get a little depressing to hear you know, how bad it is, how bad it is, how bad it is. But I guess one thing I want to emphasize is that um, I think it's still important for us to see you know, how it's changed, that you know, women are now the majority um, of, of people who are getting undergraduate college degrees. You know? Now, does that mean that everything is fixed and everything's going to be amazing? No. But um, you know, in order for us to really think about solutions and to be productive today, I think it's really important to sort of keep top of mind um, that yes, there is a problem, but we have made progress. And part of the reason for this is that it sort of forges a path where we can see that change is possible, because it is, and it's happening. And so I just want to sort of you know, say that those two messages are not incompatible, that you can sort of think about the fact that there's still a problem, as you'll hear, but that um, there has been change, and that furthermore, we can do things about it, OK? So um, that's sort of my thoughts on that. And you know, one thing I can say uh, from my perspective uniquely um, is that we know we knew this a while ago, but we're still finding out more and more that in terms of gender inequality for women in the workplace, but also outside the workplace, that stereotyping, um, in other words, our beliefs about what men and women are like. So commonly thought of, you know, women still are thought um, to be nice, um, which is great. Uh, this is called the women are wonderful effect. But um, this expectation of niceness can have some pernicious effects, right? Um, so these stereotypes are still alive and well, and they're still operating. So what we're seeing in terms of taking stock in gender um, from an academic perspective is that a lot of these um, stereotypes or beliefs have sort of gone, what you would say, underground. So when you actually ask people to sort of explicitly say, you know, do you endorse this stuff, we've seen an, a decrease in this, right? But the thing that we haven't seen um, is behaviorally, necessarily, a decrease in the amount of discrimination that's actually happening as a result of these stereotypes in particular, OK? So um, just to give you a couple of examples, um, some of you may be familiar with a study that was done uh, by a woman named Claudia Golden. I was actually an economist, but you know, one thing she found, uh, this was a while back, that in uh, professional orchestras, it used to be the case that when um, uh, musicians would uh, audition uh, to be in the orchestra, they would uh, do so sort of out in the open. So you would uh, sort of watch them audition, and then they would get chosen in some way. And what they found was that um, simply by putting a screen up in front of um, these male and female musicians, um, the percentage of women that ended up being represented in these orchestras went from 25% to 46%. Okay, so almost a doubling. And it was um, largely driven by this belief, um, not just that people sort of, uh, you know, you can't assume that necessarily anybody choosing musicians had terrible intentions or something, because I don't really think that's the appropriate way to look at this, but rather, it was sort of the expectation of what a good musician was, was somebody who um, wore tails, right, that was a man. Um, and so just that simple expectation, um, when you sort of got rid of it, I just want to leave you, leave you that with a metaphor, you know, what are things that we can do to sort of lift those stereotypes um, from our uh, sort of screening of men and women. Um, you see this huge increase in the number of women, almost a doubling, okay? 
And uh, that study was done a while ago, but you know, there's more recent stuff. I think it's my job to say a little bit about this. You know, one study that my, I did with my colleagues, uh, Joe Handelsman and Jack DeVideo, um, one in the psychology department, the other in the uh, biology department. So it's just looking at women in STEM careers and how what we did is we sent out uh, resumes that were identical, except for the fact that they had a male and a female name. And these resumes were for um, essentially um, jobs for uh, in science, actually asking uh, university professors at major research universities to say, which one of these people would you hire? They were randomly assigned, so we could say something about causality to either see a male or a female resume. And what we found is that in um, STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, you know, this bias is, is still persisting as well. So the women um, not only were less likely to be hired and chosen for these jobs, but um, they actually were said, uh, professors said that they would actually pay these women about $4,000 less a year than the men, um, and they were also less willing to mentor them, right? So, you know, you can do these sort of resume studies and see the way that these um, stereotypes are still operating, um, and they matter. And uh, Francis, excuse me, Francis has also mentioned um, some other work, uh, work that I've done on anger, but there's also work um, still showing that even today, um, when women do things like self-promote, so talk about why they're you know, uniquely qualified for a job, for example, in a job interview, or um, when they, at work, you know, sort of speak about their accomplishments and let people know, um, this is not seen very positively. So I mentioned that the stereotype of women being warm also includes an expectation that women be modest. And so what we see in terms of the research are what we call backlash effects. Um, so stereotype-based discrimination against women when they act in ways that are sort of counter to these gender stereotypes. I learned a lot from being in a business school, and one of the things I learned was about, you know, there are examples of of firms and corporations that are increasing the number of women that they have in their ranks and really reducing biases, um, one of which is through things like uh, a program for consultants, uh, an example is offering the fifth day when, when consultants travel a lot, um, they can end up overworking. And if you're a woman and a mother, this is obviously a problem. And so one idea was to just say, okay, the fifth day that you're working, um, uh, of five days in the week, you're actually going to be in the home office and not in the client's office. It's called the three, four, five. So you're spending three nights away, four days in the client's office, and the fifth day in your home office. And this intervention had a huge effect, um, made a major difference in this firm in terms of um, you know retaining women who had children, right, who really had constraints on their time, but also made the workplace generally good for everybody. And um, one of the things they did in terms of sort of thinking creatively is I noticed that they didn't actually say this was a program for women and about women and about mothers, right? Because that would sort of highlight this issue and in some ways stigmatize um, women and mothers and people with families. They just said this is a policy that we're going to implement, you know. So, um, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is how can we take these lessons and apply them to other ways of reducing stereotypes and biases? So. Um, one thing that I'm working on right now is um, there's a problem with uh, teams and groups not leveraging women's expertise. So in, I'm sure some of you have had this experience where you raise your hand to say something and you don't get called on necessarily, or maybe some of your ideas, you know, um, get attributed to somebody else and your expertise doesn't end up being um, used or utilized, leveraged um, at your organization or workplace. And uh, this is a problem, and we've shown this over and over again, but in terms of utilizing um, the strategies from, you know, not explicitly mentioning gender, I actually have done this in some of my research and found that just not even saying that this is because of gender stereotypes and biases, but rather let's get everybody to talk equally in their teams, this actually was a more effective strategy in some ways. So all I'm trying to say is it's worth thinking creatively about this and, and looking to organizations, but also just to sort of wrap up, when we're talking about um, you know, what to do, let's think about um, you know, definitely um, you know, when we're talking about fixing the woman, don't do that. Let's say um, let's find solutions that individual women can, women can use in terms of strategies and um, fixing the system, let's uh, think creatively and also um, look to people who've been successful and organizations that have been successful to see if there are things that we can learn. So good morning, everybody. Oh.
That wasn't very heartfelt. <laughs> Are you, is it too early? Is it too early for you to be here? Um, so anyway, I thought that I would just share a few um, observations and comments from somebody who's really focused on trying to figure out how to educate men and women for, um, for their futures and in, in ways that hopefully make them um, uh, come out with their best selves, not only intellectually, but just in, their own, in terms of their own humanity. Uh, and, and also, um, I focus a lot on, on women because I also worked for a period of time in a women's college. And so some of the, some of the differences between uh, private colleges that are co-ed and, and, um, and the ones that are women, are, are women only have been quite interesting for me. Um, I will say that, you know, as, as Victoria mentioned, that women typically do outnumber men in many institutions um, across the, the nation, in, particularly in terms of undergraduate uh, degrees, but in other professional and graduate schools as well, with the exception per, perhaps of STEM, the STEM fields. Uh, but in the Ivy League and more of the elite uh, institutions, we try to keep the, the, um, the, uh, the numbers to 50-50. Um, mostly because we're trying to make sure people can get dates. Um, and uh, uh, we think there's actually a value um, to having, a, um, to having a, a, an even split, as even a split as possible. Um, but, and you would ex but you would expect that because there are so many more women who are being educated, uh, that you would see more people in leadership positions. And, and yet, there was one study that said that at the rate we're going, uh, we may not have equal representation of women until 2085, and that's really quite a long way down the road, so I'd like to try to speed that up a little bit. <laughs> I would say that part of what, what we look at in student life, and again, st student life and thinking about the student experience is thinking about what goes on in the classroom, what goes on co-curricularly outside the classroom, and the entire student experience, are two trends that we have been, um, in both academic and student, student affairs, tracking for at least 15 to 20 years and trying to think about how to, how to intervene in. One is, how women um, interact in the classroom. And we find, many people find that women are less likely to speak in the classroom, although they were quite vocal in high school, that when they get to college and sometimes when they get to graduate and professional schools, they speak a little less. And we know that active participation in the classroom is often a precursor to developing self-confidence to speak in the corporate environment, as you mentioned. The other trend we also look at is what is uh, women's interaction in terms of leadership positions in student organizations. Because particularly in college, but, but also in graduate professional school, a lot of what you see in terms of leadership development and leadership experience, you get from being in an organization and running organizations and, and um, trying to have those experiences of success and failures early on. And while many students come and they get to these elite institutions having had a lot of experience outside the classroom, sometimes that experience is a little different um, when they get here. And so that's part of what um, those of us who, who think about student life um, are focusing on and have been focused on for the last 20 years. I want to mention a couple of studies that have been systematic in addressing this, these two questions. In 2003, Duke created something called the Duke Women's Initiative. I'm not sure if, if all of you know about it, but it, but it was created by a woman named uh, Nan Cohane, who used to be the president of Wellesley College, which is, which is a uh, women's college, became the president of Duke, and was really interested in trying to figure out what was women's experience at Duke. And so she had um, a pretty impressive, wide-ranging um, study that was done over a period of about a year, and it was called the Duke Women's Initiative Report that came out in 2003. And what they found was that um, the women were having a significantly different experience, the undergraduate women in particular were having a, a specific, a very specific experience, but it was very different from the men. Um, they said the norms there are strongly gender specific, and I'm actually reading from the report, in terms of everything from what one should eat or how one should dress to romantic and sexual encounters, even reaching into what is regarded as appropriate in terms of intellectual assertiveness or interest in leadership. That the idea of effortless perfection was described by many Duke female undergraduates as creating a climate for many students that too often stifled the kind of vigorous exploration of selfhood and development of enlightened respect for members of the opposite sex that one would hope to see in a place where they are looking for equality. And they called the effortless perfection as creating suffocating norms for women in terms of how they were, they were performing and what they were getting out of their Duke experience. That was 2003. In 2011, a colleague of mine, 
went to Princeton. And she asked the same question at Princeton, one of our um, close competitors. And they found in, their, in that study, the Princeton Report on Undergraduate Women's Leadership, that yes, effortless, effortless perfection is a concept that definitely exists at Princeton. And the women said that there they expected to be poised, as I'm quoting now, poised, witty, and smart, but not so witty or smart as to be threatening to men. As one alumna put it, women are supposed to do everything, do it well, and look hot while doing it. And in fact, one of the male students wrote that the cultural expectations for women at this university are clearly, starkly different, both in academics and campus leadership than they are for men. And so one of the things that this study reported on is the university needed to focus on the campus culture because it otherizes, otherizes women and how, and how we need to change that. And that's at Princeton. That was just in 2011. Now, what's been happening um, at both of these institutions, which have been much more systematic in terms of trying to figure out how to address this issue, is um, two things. One is Duke has created something called the MOXIE Project, great name. And the MOXIE Proce Project is coming out of their community service programs where they're actually having applied learning experience which helps students, particularly women, think about leadership styles. Um, and it's a year-long program. They, they go out, um, they're supporting um, they're actually supporting uh, community service in, in the U.S. and abroad, but they do actually specifically focus on leadership styles for women. Um, and I think what's most, most interesting is that Princeton has actually developed a very specific mentorship program. Um, they call it the Women's Mentorship Program. It was founded in 2011 and 2012 as a result of that study that I just mentioned. Um, and they have a group, it started with 81 members, they now have 420 female members. It is mostly a mentorship program that is mentorship, peer mentorship among women undergraduates with sponsors from around the world um, and also on campus. And they work in a pod, it's kind of like a, almost like business um, fo focus. They work in pods and they actually study le leadership. They study it um, intellectually, they look at, they look at uh, articles, they have classes, um, but they also mentor each other through the leadership process on their own campus. And so this is, these are just a couple of things that have been done um, as well. Now, not to be outdone, Harvard Law School, some of you may have seen in the last couple of years, uh, has done a work, uh, research on women in the classroom there. And I can say from my own experience in law school that yes, uh, in Harvard, um, they said that women speak less than men, and women think women and men who do speak think they know more than they actually do. Um, uh, but, um, and I know in my own experience in the Yale Law School that, that there was also at that, at that point, this is now in the 80s, uh, more women uh, or fewer women speaking than men. I think I'm sad to see that that's still happening um, as well. But they are actually trying to figure out pedagogically how do you insert or change the way the dynamics work in the classroom to make sure that women are much more um, vocal in, in class as well. And so this is a constant conversation that many of us are having um, at the undergraduate, graduate, professional level to make sure that women um, are much more, um, particularly in the classroom, much more um, uh, vocal in the classroom. Um, and then outside the classroom, there are many of us who are actually trying to figure out how to make sure that women are, um, thank you, um, who make sure that women are much more involved in organizations, but involved in the highest level. So for example, my own, my previous institution of University of Chicago, where we had one of the first women editors of their version of the Yale Daily News, but it's the Chicago Maroon. Um, it happens that there were four women vice presidents meeting with the editorial board of the Chicago Maroon with the first woman editor who did not speak a word for the hour and a half that we were having a conversation about university policy, not a word. Now, in the room were the four, four vice presidents. One happened to be the former editor of the Chicago Tribune, so you know she was not happy. Uh, there was a general counsel and um, the director of communications and me. And one of the things we had to do is we started then and there taking her out to lunch to talk to her about what it meant to actually be in that role and how to, to move forward um, going, going, you know, as she was in that role for that year. And then we started a mentorship program because we realized it was actually rampant. It wasn't just her, it was everybody else. Um, and I will say the other thing, and I will just mention this because I want to talk about it when we have question and answer is that as global universities, part of the issue we have to address is that 
this is a gender issue, but it may also be a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's changed over the last 10 years is sometimes I can't figure out how to advise a student if this is a cultural issue or a gender issue, and then now we're having to really figure out how to embed some of those um, necessary uh, conversations into the structure of the conversations we're having with students to help them navigate the corporate world they find themselves in. So I'm told I have to wrap up, sorry. <laughs> I'm Kim Shaman, and I'm a um, sociologist uh, trained as a, as a social demographer, really. And um, I spent a lot of my career studying um, the underrepresentation of women in science. And, um, and over the past 10 years, um, since about 2003, I've become involved um, with NSF advanced programs, first as sort of an observer and a, a person watching the University of Michigan program for afar, from afar, and also the University of Wisconsin um, program, some of the first there. Um, and now in, at my own institution, I'm, a, I'm one of the PIs on, on that. So I have a lot of information about um, women in science, but I want to um, I want to sort of start by talking uh, or giving you some numbers about um, where we are for with gender in academia in general, um, aggregated and um, not very specific, but in academia in general. And um, I'll start by saying why this is important. Um, so academia is important in general. The faculty in our institutions of higher education, especially our Research One institutions, is extremely important. We set the agenda in many ways. Um, we set the agenda in research. We choose where it's going, and we are in um, unique positions to respond to new, um, new challenges in the world. Um, we also train the next generation. That's an obvious thing, right? We train, train, train the next generation of individuals who will go into these leadership positions um, through our undergraduate teaching and our graduate teaching. So we set the agenda in the classroom about what is talked about, how it's talked about, um, who's encouraged and who's not. Um, we are therefore a primary node in those networks that then generate um, the next generation of leaders and, and send people off um, and give people who are talented opportunities to further develop those talents. Uh, we play a role in the, out we therefore, I'm gonna use the, the tagline of this conference, we are primary players in generating access outcomes and equity, not just in higher education, but out in the broader world. So it's really important to understand who is, who is here setting that agenda. So in any, I, I'm gonna start out on a high note, right? We need to acknowledge, when we're starting to look at gender equity in higher education, we should first start by acknowledging the immense period of leaning in that women have done over the past, um, past history in the United States. So um, here's the trend in the representation of women among new PhDs from 1950 to 2000 using NSF data. And so you can see this massive increase that started in the, in the um, 1970s and, and um, how it has continued. The rate of increase has um, tapered as we start to hit what might be a ceiling. Um, around 50%, um, so we're up to about 40, uh, 45, 46, 47% as of um, 2011 and 12. Um, this, whether this will be a ceiling is a big question, right? Because um, at the lower levels of, of higher education, at the baccalaureate um, level and at the master's level, women in many fields are, are the majority and across the board are the majority at the undergraduate level. So, so this is the pool of the talent that the higher, higher that the PhD will be drawing from. So we'll see just what the trend holds. So, um, but to understand the current situation for faculty in higher education, I'm gonna focus on that later part of the period, 1994 on. Um, that's where I can get reliable data. So I'm a, I'm a data girl, not a, not a storyteller girl. <laughs> so, um, um, but I'll tell stories later. All right, so um, they'll be true, nonfiction stories. So, um, so let's look at this time period. So um, remember that the PhD is, is across the board, not always there are exceptions, but pretty much it's the required degree for um, faculty positions. So the trend in the representation of women in, amongst PhDs gives us a good benchmark against which to measure how we're doing in faculty hiring and development of faculty um, at the, uh, within our institutions. So since 1994, the representation of women amongst assistant professors, um, at, and this is only at research universities, so I've selected only at research intensive, research one universities, um, the, those Carnegie classifications. So the, the trend since 1994, the assistant level has tracked that availability pool pretty well. 
um, and um, exceeded it in some periods. These are not statistically significant differences, so we'll just say we're, we're doing pretty well at that hiring stage. So I'll note right here that these are aggregated data. So there's certainly areas where we're doing well, and there's areas where we are doing less than well and need more attention, and, and the STEM fields is, is particularly one of those, um, and other, um, other areas we can identify. Um, but I also want to guard against that sort of exceptionalism, and I'll come back to this at the end. Um, STEM is not an exception in many ways. Um, these issues that are dealt with, uh, that are faced there, are faced um, to varying degrees in other fields. And um, in doing a lot of the applied work that I do, I often face people saying, well, oh, this is not a problem in my field, art, or this is not a problem because we, we're doing really well on this. Um, I, I think that, that that giving, letting ourselves off the hook is one of the primary reasons for slow progress. And so I'm gonna um, ask that we guard against that. All right, so looking beyond the assistant level, what, how are we doing at the associate level? So here we have the, um, the um, representation of women amongst associate professors, and so we're, we're a bit lower there, but also an upward trend. Um, between 94 and 2012, we went from 27 to 41 percent women in amongst associate professors. And then um, the um, full professor um, level, we're um, still an upward trend. We'll try to keep that positive, um, that positive theme going, but we're still very far behind what the pool is, right? So we um, have gone from about um, 12, 13 percent up to um, 26 percent um, representation amongst full faculty at Research One universities. Where are the women in these research universities? They still tend to be very overrepresented in instructor positions and lecturer positions. And this trend is one that bounces around a bit due to hiring and budgetary constraints and, and things like that, but, it, um, but the trend doesn't seem to be changing much, right? This is where the women are overrepresented. And then if we look ahead, um, Oops, did I go the wrong way? Yes, if we look ahead um, to the future and sort of make some, these are really back of the envelope projections and I'll acknowledge that. Um, as a demographer, I'd love to do a full life course analysis or life table analysis and incorporate you know, retirement rates and things like that and, and, and impose different assumptions. This is very simple. So the assumption here is that, the, um, that sort of a ceiling will be reached amongst the, uh, for the representation of women in, uh, amongst PhDs at about 50% maybe a little bit higher when we aggregate all fields. And then just assuming that there will be a linear trend moving along sort of a regression line estimated or fit to those uh, the past trends since 1994. So if we look ahead, um, we can take a look at just how long it, it might be before we reach equity in these, um, in these different uh, levels of, of our faculty. And so we can see that it will be another 10 years about before we um, get to equity in, um, the, at the associate level and another, th another 30 years until women are equitably represented amongst full professors. So now the parallel lines here, they're upward moving, but they're parallel, and so that might indicate that this is just how the process is gonna happen, right? This is cohort replacement. This is the process by which the younger generations of faculty who, where there is greater representation of women take to make it to those higher levels of, of academia. But the problem here is that the gaps between these, these lines, these parallel lines, represent about 20 years. So if you look sort of across, you'll see that the level of representation for assistant professors um, in 1994 Sorry, I'm going to use the, um, the, the level uh, for the associate professors. The representation of, a, uh, representation of women amongst associate professors in 1994 was not met until about now, 2014. And so 20 years is an awfully long time and certainly represents longer than it would, would take for the average associate professor to be considered for and promoted to a full professor level. So there's, a extreme, there's really significant delays that we really need to examine. And so I am going to talk about the, um, so a direct cause here of this delay is the fact that it takes women um, longer to a, both attain tenure and to be promoted to full. And that especially the soci associate professor, professor ranks, excuse me, are, is an area where women tend to stall out for periods of time and sometimes that's where their promotion ends at these research universities. So that, that primary um, cause of these delays is also caused by a number of factors that have um, 
cumulative effects over the course of, of women's careers. Um, there is inadequate, um, by and large, inadequate family leave policies and or uptake and utilization of family leave policies. Promotion policies um, may be unnecessarily competitive and um, may, be, may incorporate instances where there's opportunities for both unconscious or implicit bias to, um, to take effect at the evaluation, but also structural biases. So when, um, when it's necessary for the individual to self-promote, to ask for, to, to, um, to get outside offers, all of these structural constraints or these sort of the way we do things um, those can get in the way and generate more um, generate inequities in our processes. There are gender differences in work distribution. This has been an area of research um, very recently spearheaded by and large by advanced NSF advanced programs. And I can say more about what that is um, if, if you're um, unfamiliar with that program. The research shows that women t spend more time on teaching, service, and mentorship, that the distribution of teaching and service tends to be inequitable itself, such as the, so that the, um, the more um, <coughs> eminent forms of service, the, more, uh, the, the forms that have real impacts, positive impacts on careers tend not to be the ones that women are, um, have access to or are invited into. Um, and also that these activities don't tend to be rewarded. Um, they, they, are, they get a lot of lip service and, and valuation, um, but they are not the things that we are rewarded for. And so we're um, faced with a scarcity issue. We have a scarcity of time, right? Time is a zero sum game. The more time you spend on Two. The more time you spend on, on those, um, so then I have to talk even faster. Okay, <laughs> the more time you spend on, on those other activities, the less on those activities which we are reviewed for. Okay, so there's also climates of inclusion, and there's a lot of research that shows that, sorry, climates of exclusion. Our departments still tend to have these climates that are not necessarily the best for work um, for anyone involved, not just the women there. And there's a lot of research showing that there's really significant segregation of networks. Certainly there's segregation of networks by discipline, but also by sub-discipline and by gender within those disciplines. And this means that um, women are not getting access to the opportunities um, to um, get resources and exposure and recognition. So what are the solutions? So um, I want to just mention a number of institutional um, changes. So the NSF Advanced Program is founded on the, the premise that um, women have clearly shown that they can do these jobs, but that the institutions are not places where they are able to thrive. And to have an impact on the individual careers of women and also to have an impact that's sustainable, to really create change, we really need to look at our institutions, our policies, and our practices. And so what are the solutions that we require? We require institutions to, um, to pay attention to climate within departments. And I'll also acknowledge that none of this is easy. It actually takes a lot of resources and time and attention, and that's one of those institutional things we need to do. Institutions can orient themselves toward time and attention to these issues. Climate within departments, the, the policies and practices surrounding merit and promotion um, systems, these all need to be looked at. Certainly family leave needs to be really investigated. What are the policies? How are they used? What are the consequences, both positive and negative, for using those, those leave policies? Dual career hiring is a really, really big one. This is also an area of research that I, of, of mine, migration and dual career couples. So um, this is a structural thing because women tend to be married to, um, or partner with men, when they're partnered with men, who are slightly older than they. That means that their, their male partners tend to be slightly ahead of them in, in the career trajectories or career development. And this means that it's, uh, there's also differences in the, um, in the, um, the partners that, that actually occur. Women who are partnered tend to have partners who are also career oriented, whereas for men there's a much bigger variance. So if we really want to increase the equity in our recruitment, then we really as institutions need to invest very heavily in, uh, in dual career hiring programs, and those programs need to take a variety of forms. We need to look at um, ability, our ways of fostering networks and calling attention to unintentional oversights. We need our colleagues to call out those organizations that are not um, inviting women to be keynote speakers. And I have a number of colleagues who I would highlight their efforts on this, and, and they're wonderful um, advocates for, for their colleagues. 
Um, make, and institutions need to make inclusion an explicit goal. We need to recognize that dealing with, um, we also need to guard against that exceptionalism. Yale is an exceptional institution, and this conference itself is an exceptional organization and provides, or represents exceptional opportunities for doing the networking and, and elevating this conversation. But institutions like Yale need to recognize that you are dealing with the same, the same types of issues. All of these institutions are dealing with the same types of issues. So tap into those resources that are already available, and certainly the Na the National Advance um, Network is one that we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of creative ideas about how to generate institutional change and sustain it. I want to thank Yale Women for inviting me today to be a part of this conversation. Um, and I'm just going to reiterate a little of what Francis said, which is that the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers University is really, I very modestly say, uh, the nation's most trusted source for all things women in American politics. Um, and since 1971, we have been keeping track of the numbers and the trends for women office holders, candidates, and voters. Um, we really keep the story of women's political participation in American politics. And this is my little clicker. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Okay, great, thank you. Um, we also do current cutting edge research on issues affecting women in politics. We look at the impact of women in office, why does it matter to have more women, women's routes to elective office, how do they get there, and how are their paths to politics different than those of their male colleagues. We also look at electoral reforms around the country and how those might have a disproportionate impact on women's representation. We also are keenly aware of having a responsibility to turn our research into action. So we make sure that our research is also accessible to the activist community that is trying to increase and support women's participation and we conduct our own action programs to engage more women from our Ready to Run program, which is a nonpartisan campaign training program that is now up and running in more than 14 states. Um, our new leadership program, which is for college women, and we are active uh, in 26 states around the country. And finally, our most recent initiative, Teach a Girl to Lead, to make women's public leadership visible to kids, uh, K through 12, boys and girls, so that kids growing up see that women can and are uh, public leaders. So I always get the job of telling the very depressing story of where we are nationally uh, when it comes to women's political participation. So currently, and you can see these numbers on the screen, there are 20 women in the United States Senate, 16 Democrats, four Republicans, and of those 20 women, only one is a woman of color, Maisie Hirano, um, who is the U.S. Senator from Hawaii. Um, at the U.S. House of Representatives, 79 women are currently serving, 60 Democrats, 19 Republicans, and of those 79, 29 are women of color. Um, I will tell you that both of these numbers are records, so we've never been higher, um, which is a little depressing also. Um, <laughs> Now, less than one quarter of all state legislators and all statewide elected executive positions in this country are held by women. Um, we now have five women who serve as governor, four Republicans and one Democrat, and sadly we can fit all of them on, in one little box on a screen. Um, and two of them are women of color, and these two women are the very first women of color ever elected uh, to be a state's chief executive. They are Nikki Haley um, from South Carolina um, and Susanna Martinez from New Mexico, and both of those women are Republicans. Now, I wanna put this in a little bit of historic perspective, which is to tell you that the number of men who are currently serving in the United States Senate is greater than the number of women who have ever served in the United States Senate, um, and the number of men who are currently serving as governor is greater than the number of women who have ever held gubernatorial office. So you can see from these numbers that women are still 
the other. Um, and that is what we want to talk about here today. The question is, why do we care? So we're counting all these all these numbers, what does it matter? We know from our research that it does matter that more women serve, that women make a difference when they're there, that they bring a different perspective uh, because of their own life experiences to the making of public policy, to what issues are a priority for them, and frankly, also the way that government works. Um, how many women in this room right now have a credit card in their own name? Okay, you can thank Bella Abzug, uh, a woman member of Congress. <laughs> who was a champion of the Equal Credit Act. Uh, before the Equal Credit Act, women needed to have either their husband or their father come in and vouch for them, and that, that is no longer the case. When I grew up, I did not play sports in school, um, not in junior high school, high school, or in college. My daughters, who are now, I have twins, they're 24, both of them were active in sports, and that is because of Title IX, um, and that is because of a congresswoman named Patsy Mink from Hawaii, who was the first woman of color in, in Congress. Uh, and she championed the issue of equal funding um, for programs for girls and boys in education, carrying on to men and women in colleges. It is not just about sports, but it has had a huge impact on sports, which I think has a huge impact on women's leadership moving forward, right? When girls are engaged in sports, we find that they tend to take on leadership further down the road. Um, the Violence Against Women Act was recently reauthorized, um, and we saw Democratic and Republican women in both the House and particularly in the Senate coming together and supporting the reauthorization um, in the Senate. Uh, Republican women almost unanimously supported the reauthorization where on, among the Republican men it was really a, among the men it was really a partisan divide. So we saw women making a difference there. Um, family medical leave um, in this country has happened because of, I'm proud to say, a congresswoman from my state of New Jersey, Marge Rockema, a Republican, a moderate Republican woman who had her own personal life experience where her son was very ill and ultimately died from leukemia, and she was able to stay home with him. And she believed that it was important that all women had that option or all families had that option. Um, so uh, she was a champion. It, didn't, it passed in Congress for many years, but her president, Ronald Reagan, and then George Bush would not sign it. Um, it was the first piece of legislation that Bill Clinton signed, so it was a really interesting example of that bipartisanship, which we don't see very much anymore. Um, there are now three states that have paid family leave, New Jersey, uh, California, and Washington State, and it's women in those state legislatures that made the difference on that legislation. Um, and then finally, I think the most recent example of the way women govern differently and their ability to work across party lines was during the government shutdown. Um, it truly was, I think, we talk about the sisterhood in the Senate shutting down the shutdown, and it was women led in large part by Susan Collins from Maine, um, who really led the way and made it possible for there to be a conversation across party lines. Um, and this was something that was acknowledged by both Senators Pryor and McCain, Democrat and Republican, who said it really was women in their institution that made the difference. So why aren't the numbers better? Um, we do know that when women run, Women win at about the same rate as their male colleagues. Um, the problem is that we just don't have more women running. Um, we need more women to file as candidates, but we simply aren't seeing that. And I want you to just take, this is the state legislative numbers from 1976 to the last election cycle. And you can see uh, the blue bar are the candidates, the purple, the winners, and holdovers. And we saw from 1976 to 1992 kind of slow, steady progress. 92 was, of course, some of you may remember, the great year of the woman, um, where we doubled the number of women in the United States House of Representatives. We haven't seen growth like that since. Um, but you can see that the number of candidates really uh, the, uh, mirrors the number of winners and office holders. 
The challenge has been since 92, 94, we've pretty much been flat, and this is true at the state legislative level. It's fairly true at the congressional level. We've actually seen decline in the number of women holding statewide elected positions. And I will tell you that this election cycle that we are in right now is no different. We have no records at any level of office for women running, um, and we are not anticipating seeing tremendous growth. In fact, there is a real possibility that in the U.S. House of Representatives we will be flat, um, that, and that might be the good news story. Um, so that's really, uh, that's, or the good news scenario. It could, it could be worse. Um, so the question here is, why aren't more women running? If we know it makes a difference um, and we know that it matters to have them there, why can't we get more women to run? I'm gonna go through a few reasons really quickly. One is money. I think women um, may be a little more cautious about running because they are facing the challenge of raising money, but we do know that women raise comparable amounts of money to men in comparable races, so we could take that off the table. It is harder for women because women tend to come into politics from professions that are less moneyed, their networks are less moneyed, and so they're raising funds in smaller denominations, so it takes them that much longer to raise the same amount of money. Um, we find that women, and maybe this is very sensible, um, women tend to think about working around government. I think if you looked at Congress right now, you might really say, why would I want to go there? There's nothing getting done. If I want to make change, I'll work in the nonprofit world. I'll start my own nonprofit or be on a board or do community service. But so at some point, what we find is that women realize that if they want to make systemic change, you can do that within government. And that's what makes them take that leap into running for office. Family is still an issue. Um, women are still in 2014, the primary caregivers at home. They are working full-time jobs outside the home. Most of these state legislative positions around the country are not full-time jobs and don't pay full-time salaries. So in fact, we're asking women as they enter into politics to take on what can be, in effect, a third full-time job. Um, we do know that women tend to run when they're older. Um, they are less likely than their male colleagues to have children under the age of 18 still living at home. Um, we also find that women need to be recruited to run. Women are much more likely to have run for their first elective office because they were recruited. Men look in the mirror um, one day and say, my God, I would be a great state legislator. Um, <laughs> women are much more reluctant. Um, and they need institutions like political parties to encourage them to run, to give them that kind of go ahead. Um, and I think uh, that has been a real challenge and we can talk about that in the, in the whole issue of, the, of lean in. Um, and you know, I am quite convinced that if both political parties really made a serious commitment to getting more women elected to office, we would have a lot more women in office. And neither party is doing the job, although you can see from the numbers before, the Democratic Party seems to be doing better. And it becomes a little bit of a catch-22, right, as more women are in the party and are attaining leadership positions like uh, being the minority leader in the U.S. House of Representatives or the chair of the Democratic National Committee or heading the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, they are in a position to do the recruiting. There are women there who care about getting more women there. That is not the case on the Republican side. Um, and we also know that the parties don't recruit women um, in the same ways that they recruit men. Um, and finally, I think part of it is simply looking at those institutions. They don't see people like them in those institutions. Um, and as Marion Wright Edelman said, you can't be what you can't see. Um, that's not just true for kids. I think that's true for all of us. Um, and if we don't think of those institutions yet as space that is welcoming to women, I think it, it is harder and harder to get women to, to take that step. As I said, I think there are some, some solutions. I think one of them is clearly the issue of recruitment. We have to change these numbers. We have to get more women into the political pipeline. Um, but we can't just recruit those women. We also have to support them once they are there. So it's not enough to go to a woman and say, you should run for office. I really want you to run for state legislature. If you get a woman to run for the state legislature, you better have her back when she's running. And that means volunteering for her, raising money for her, helping her in any way that she needs to get elected. Um, we need to put pressure on the political parties, both sides of the aisle, for more women to be there. It's not enough to have this kind of disproportionate 
um, leaning um, with so many more Democrats than Republicans. Democratic women in Congress tell us that they want more Republican women in office because there are places where that compromise can happen. We see it in the United States Senate where the women senators have set a bar that no one else seems to be able to match, which is the Democratic and Republican women actually have dinner together, which seems like a pretty low bar. But <laughs> apparently that's not happening very many places. They're the ones that are able to do it. So the Democratic women want more Republican women there. And I think, I, I, just, I just have to say that I wanna just mention something off of what Victoria said, which was the idea about angry um, stereotypes and can angry uh, women get ahead. And that really got me thinking about my governor, um, right, in terms of stereotypes. <laughs> I don't know if you all just saw this tape where he just told somebody, uh, Heckler, uh, who was actually a council member, to sit down and shut up. I can't honestly imagine a woman being able to pull that off. So we do still have some serious issues of stereotypes. So I'm going to end there and we can open up the conversation. Thank you. Questions? Is there any research about children and how we can influence children's stereotypes? Uh, one of my um, graduate students who just finished did um, an extensive content analysis of the Sears um, gift book over time and showed very clearly that there is an increasing trend, you know, that things were sort of gendered, then became less gendered during the 1970s, and that we are in a period of history when toys and these everyday products which convey stereotypes to us are amazingly gendered. And that feeds that, that assumption of essential gender differences which feed our, our stereotypes and implicit biases. So I think we, we really need to look at these things, not trivialize that type of, that it's, not, it's extremely important. We also need to vote with our dollars, right? And we need to be vocal about what it is we want to see for our children, right? We we go out and, and get things. And, you know, I, I make conscious efforts around that. I had a nice conversation on the, fo on the plane coming out here with another mom of teenagers um, talking about what television shows do you actually watch or what have you watched together? I'm a big fan, fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Campy, but wonderful, wonderful opportunities for teaching. So things like that are really, really important. Um, so there was actually a study done by um, the Gina Davis Institute, which is out at UCLA, um, that looks at women, the depiction of women and girls in the media. And from my perspective, we, were, we honed in on this issue of what did women, were women being portrayed in films um, for kids as public leaders? And what they found was that in G-rated films, less than 1% of the public leaders that were depicted were female. Um, and so there is this, you know, some of it's overt and some of it's very, you know, it's subtle. Uh, but th those are the messages. And that's actually why we've initiated this new project called Teach a Girl to Lead. And it's for, it's not really targeted to the kids, it's targeted to the adults and the lives of children. So teachers, um, educators of all kinds, youth group organizations, and we have allies of all kinds of groups out there, but I urge you to go to our website. It's called teachagirltolead.org, and there are resources, books um, for kids at every age that are about women as public leaders, whether they're biographies or fiction stories, um, films and videos that are available. We are developing curriculum materials for K through 12, um, it's a really exciting project, but we do need to intervene earlier, and we do need to show our girls that these are possibilities for them. There's a lot of research now, or it's starting, and I'm doing some of this work myself, on um, stereotypes of African-American women and women of color. Um, and we're seeing really um, sort of different effects in some cases, some similar things, similar experiences. But for example, um, when African-American women express anger, they don't experience the same degree of backlash because the stereotype um, is, is different for them, essentially. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff like that. But I would encourage us to really keep asking those questions and always keep that top of mind. And um, it's, it's not that you know we're all not thinking about this stuff as well, um, it's just that you know, we really do need um, those kinds of questions to keep us uh, sort of on the ball and aware of it um, in this forum. But, you know, the other question was also about what is sort of the relative role of men and women, and do women 
perpetuate these stereotypes themselves. And you know, I think it's worth um, also just noting that um, myself, you know, when I'm talking about um, the influence of stereotypes, um, I think a lot of these things really are implicit and unconscious. And they're sort of more cognitive, they're not motivated, meaning um, oftentimes there isn't bad intentions behind it. And so what my work shows and a lot of the work does show is that men and women do hold these stereotypes to the same extent and do in fact show the same kind of behavioral discrimination as each other. So demonizing or talking about one gender or the other doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think in terms of changing stereotypes, what does make a lot of sense are some of the things that we've addressed, but just to kind of reiterate once again that you know, it's, it's worth thinking about um, you know, organizational, institutional, structural fixes that have been mentioned, um, but also doing that in a way that's sort of creative. And in terms of reducing stereotyping, you know, sometimes there may be ways that um, you might not even expect. So it might sometimes be best not to even kind of highlight gender when we're thinking about um, you know, different structures or things we can change, because sometimes that puts people on the defensive. But anyway, with, with all of that said, um, you know, I just want to say that there's nothing wrong with the color pink. That's the like <laughs> last thing I wanted to end with, to answer your question. Uh, kind of joking. Um, the men and women of this generation actually seem to be very connected um, to each other and very much team-oriented, just as a generation. In particular, I'm talking about the undergraduate who I spend many, much more time with. Um, and I see this in the climate change work that's being done on campus with Melanie Boyd, who happens to be in, a, in the room, who is working with both men and women to really effectuate change to make it safer um, for all of them, particularly for women, to, to, in, uh, to interact in an environment that is, is, um, that is safe, that is respectful. Uh, and so I just think in this generation, because of technology, and this is actually the good part of the technology, they are able to talk to each other, connect with each other, and they have a different set of questions, I have to say, about what it means to be successful. One of, one of the key issues I think we have to look at as people who are a little bit older and thinking about you know, success as being in the corporate world, I have students talking to me more about you know, why, why is that so and why can't you give us other definitions of success and other people to look at um, because I'm not so sure that's a balanced life, number one. I'm not so sure I want to actually do that. And if I am going to do it, I know I'm going to take a little bit longer. So, so if, it's, if you're looking at a time frame, I may actually bust your curve because my time frame is going to be very different. So, so there's ways in which we have to think about success may look very different for this generation. We may still get there, but we may have to actually uh, reframe the, the conversation based on what they're, what they're looking at. Um, I think there's a sense of empowered vulnerability that the, this generation is willing to, to embrace. Um, and uh, so they're, they're willing to call it as they see it. Uh, they work much more um, within the, um, so they're less radical, I would say, to go to the radical question, in terms of bra burning, although we still get some of that, um, some of the, the protests, but they are, very, they are very good at working the system um, as a group, and, so, and they've actually made more change because the people that they're working with are the former bra burners, or their equivalent. And so the system is where the administration is much more um, proactive and the students are working much more within the administration. So I see that as being kind of a, a different way in which this generation of students is working to make change. And I think that they're much more willing to do that going forward. And I hope that that means that they're going to be much more willing to be in the system and be politicians and, and, and the like. Because I just think that they're functioning in a very different way, which is positive, a positive way to end.